Um, and it's my pleasure to give you a talk today on uh, back and neck pain. It's a super common uh, problem in society and um, I suspect uh, that you might be suffering with it as well. So like my consults, feel free to stand up, lie down and otherwise uh, during the course of this talk, it's uh, not uncommon, um, especially around me anyway. Um, now, the talk today that I thought I'd give everyone, um, can, you, can you hear me if I stand over here? Is that all right? Yep, good. Um, we'll try and get through a lot. I, I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail in regards to what sorts of surgery are things and, and really minutia. I think it'd be hopefully helpful to most people to speak in general kind of terms. So talk about what back pain and what neck pain really is in, um, when I speak about it and um, talk about some of the common causes of pain that uh, people can experience and then some of the ways that it can be recommended to help reduce the pain that people are experiencing in their back or their neck and then look at what your GP might do say if you had tried all the things at home and uh, weren't uh, improving as you'd like what they would do and then going on to look at when would it be needed to come and see a specialist surgeon like myself because as you know most people don't you know they can the vast majority of back pain and neck pain can be managed without needing to uh, go and see a specialist doctor um, and then if you did come to see me what would be expected what would I talk about what would you talk about what sorts of options would we discuss and what are common management uh, strategies that might be employed and then um, some of the things that excite me, so the advancements in spinal surgery, which are always interesting to talk about, um, we'll touch on those briefly. And then we'll have a little bit of a look at what's on the uh, horizon for spinal surgery in the next five to 10 years as well. Again, because that's what I think is interesting to talk about. Um, so let's crash on. Um, so back pain is really, so back pain and neck pain, they're very similar entities and, and you can kind of use uh, them interchangeably really in, in terms of the different types of things that occur. Um, there are very, two very different sorts of problems that can occur when you've got a problem with your neck or your, or your back. Um, one is that you can have a radicular type pain or, or that's pain that is due to a problem in the back but felt uh, down the legs and so that's this type of thing and so it's a searing or burning type of pain and it's not uncommon for people to think they've got a problem in their leg or a problem in their, their hand and, or their wrist and that's often people call that sciatica okay that's that nerve pain in the arm it's known as brachialgia it's obviously less commonly uh, called that the um, that's usually caused by spinal stenosis. That's a, a word that you've probably heard uh, uh, used before. And that's spinal stenosis is just a narrowing of the tunnel uh, through which nerves uh, travel. And that's often due to something like a disc bulge or a disc rupture, as they're usually the main wear points in the spine. And then um, other things that can commonly cause this kind of problem are bone spurs and that's uh, something else you might have uh, heard of uh, before. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a problem in the design of the spine in that um, it does wear out, no different than your wrist or your knee, but the, the catch is that there are these nerves in very close uh, proximity to the structures that wear out and so then they're affected. The second type of pain that is commonly experienced uh, due to neck or back problems is what's called axial pain. Um, and so that's pain that's usually just felt in the neck, sometimes a little bit in the shoulders, or uh, pain that's felt in the low back. Um, and sometimes it's also felt a little bit in the uh, buttock and sometimes in the groin as well. And that's really directly due to the wear and tear that's occurring in the neck or in the back. So actually very vastly different uh, things. And, and actually when it comes to treating these types of problems, they're usually quite vastly different uh, uh, approaches that we take. Um, the, the axial pain, it, it's commonly where uh, activity related, just like knee arthritis is you know, activity related when you experience it. Whereas the nerve pain and nerve symptoms, people often experience those when they're lying down in bed even, it, it, they're quite awful. Back pain is a huge problem. So if you look at um, all of the presentations to a general practitioner, about uh, three odd percent 
of all presentations to GPs are due to back pain. And if you think about the, the enormous spectrum of problems that can occur in the body that someone might go to see their GP about, that's a huge number. So it's a really, really big problem. And that's not taking into account all the people who manage this problem at home without going to see their GP. There's plenty of people who go directly to see their chiro uh, or their physio or otherwise uh, to have this problem treated. Um, and it's estimated that at any point in time, about 16% of the Australian population has a back problem or is experiencing uh, a back problem. And then if you look at overall the experience of people in their life, well, actually the vast majority of people, up to 90% of people, will have a time where they've had back pain. Uh, it's actually quite unusual for someone not to have uh, pain in their back at all in their life. Um, and not surprisingly, like a lot of things that are largely due to wear and tear, um, you don't really experience them until about your mid-30s and then you start to feel the effects of wear and tear. Okay. Um, and so when you look at, at any point in time, there's probably about, if you look at the um, age group 55 to 65, about 30% of people are actually at a point in time experiencing pain in their back. So, big problem. Um, there's a couple of main reasons structurally within the back as to what uh, will be generating pain. And it's mainly to look at the different structures. And, and the reason I put this up here is so when uh, terminology that you might see uh, on the internet or referred to by your GP or in the MRI or CT scan report, um, I can illustrate it to you. So um, you'll all be familiar with a, a disc which is uh, the spongy shock absorber, which is located between uh, the two bones. And that's, um, again, subject to wear and tear changes, similar to any sort of cartilage, be it in your knee, your hip or otherwise. And that in itself, as in time, can wear out and people can get discogenic pain. And that's usually experiences pain either directly in their neck or directly in their back, particularly when they're upright or uh, doing heavy sort of manual activity or even less heavy manual activity like, say, vacuuming, for example. The, um, the facet joints at the very back of the spine, there are little joints um, that articulate as the discs move, and they're probably roughly about the same size as the, the, um, the joints in your hand, and they're exactly the same in their uh, structural composition as the joints in your hand or your knee or your hip or otherwise, and they wear out and they get arthritis and they, they cause people uh, backache when they're upright, when they're leaning back or, or twisting are, are common ones for that. And then the other main cause of back pain is nerve pain or nerve compression. And as I mentioned before, the nerves all run in tight little tunnels with not a lot of extra space. And so just like your, um, the knuckles in your hand enlarge as you get older, as we grow bone spurs and that type of thing, um, they start to encroach on the nerves and, and can generate pain in that, uh, that way. So those are the main things we're talking about when we're talking about uh, back pain or neck pain. It's, it's the same from the neck to the back. Now, there are some causes of pain that, are, that I refer to as being irreversible. So there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so but they are interesting because if you have them, then we just sort of accept that these are things that need to be managed as best as possible. And um, we can't go reversing them or, or permanently altering them uh, without a, a major intervention. And so we know there's actually a, a poor lot of people who um, have a genetic predisposition to having accelerated wear changes in their discs of their spine. They usually don't know about it until they're in their sort of mid to late 30s. And these people, there's, there's not much you can do other than manage the symptoms of the uh, pain that they're experiencing. It's not very common though, fortunately, but uh, in my office it is a little bit common. Um, when it comes to age, as I said to you, you can't do anything about your age, unfortunately. Once you're over 35, we start to experience back pain and neck pain more commonly. We know that usually uh, males are more affected on a, um, a population basis. It doesn't mean that females can't be affected, and, um, but just as a pure statistical type uh, uh, look. And um, 
there are things that you can't really change retrospectively and that's the type of activities you've undertaken. So be that uh, occupations that involve heavy lifting, twisting or a sedentary uh, type um, occupation like sitting at your desk all day. Vibrating machinery and um, driving usually light trucks that don't have adequate um, seating can also um, increase the rate of uh, back pain that, that's experienced. So these things we can't really change. With a little bit of knowledge um, and hopefully newer, um, uh, newer types of technology in regards to occupational safety, some of these things are improved. As you know, there's the introduction of sit-stand desks, air ride seats, all this type of thing. Um, now, I think probably that the most useful thing of all that I'll talk about today are that what's called the reversible causes of back pain. And so these are the things that we can actually intervene in today, this afternoon, um, to try and reduce the amount of back pain that's been experienced. And so these are, are things that, look, they're not easy fixes by any means, but they are things that have been identified as being major causes of back pain that can be uh, reversed. So one of them is actually smoking. And uh, a lot of smokers I, I see, they say, oh, why didn't somebody tell me this you know, five or 10 years ago before my neck looks like that on an MRI? Um, and so nicotine has a, a really negative impact on tissue healing uh, to the point where the risk of infection after surgery is dramatically elevated. And I, I really push my patients not uh, to be smoking for a good six weeks prior to any surgery. Um, it also inhibits the uh, natural healing process that goes on in all the tissues in the body. And so like most things, they're in this constant state of being damaged from the activities that you might do. Um, and th then the healing is inhibited and it doesn't take much for um, particularly the discs in the spine to reach this point where they're being more damaged than they are being healed and they experience accelerated degeneration. The discs are, are actually quite amazing um, structures in the body. If you look at the, the pressure inside a disc, even when you're lying down, it's an, it's an odd way to measure things, but this is the way that blood pressure is measured in millimetres of mercury. So even when you're lying down, the pressure inside the disc is about 75 millimetres of mercury. And when you're standing up, this is an average weight um, person, standing up is about 100 millimetres of mercury. Everything heals with, um, you know, uh, by um, requiring nutrients from the blood supply. Um, the blood supply to a disc, the disc is kind of like a sealed bearing surface. It, there's very little uh, nutrient supply and very little blood supply. It all perfuses in, uh, in very little amounts. And if you look at the mean arterial pressure, which is at the average pressure of your um, blood, it's about 70 to 100. So the ability of the body to pump nutrients into a structure that's been constantly damaged is actually really quite limited. So it's not surprising that these things do indeed wear out in time. And when we're doing things that inhibit their ability to heal, like blocking up the small capillaries um, by smoking, it, it really does uh, accelerate the, the wear and tear type changes that occur. The, um, if you look at patients who either do have back problems or don't have back problems. If you look at current smokers, it's actually quite interesting to see the proportion of them or the proportion of people with back problems that are current smokers versus the people who uh, do not have back problems. Actually, most of them never smoked. So it's a very interesting, this is a, uh, from the, um, uh, it's the Australian census data that's been uh, pulled from this, um, uh, level of information. So it really is broad Australian data. Um, so that's, that's um, smoking. There is some uh, science to say that people who cease smoking without doing anything else actually do experience an improvement in their back pain. It's not a miracle, they don't experience a complete resolution of it, but they certainly do uh, experience a noticeable and recordable improvement. Now, the probably a significantly difficult problem to change uh, in a lot of people is obesity. And as you know, uh, unfortunately, more and more of the Australian population is now struggling with obesity. And it has a direct effect on the lower back. It has a direct effect on the neck. The, um, 
it's and it's not it's not simple. It's not just a simple uh, equation of more weight is more load is more wear and tear is more pain being generated. It's far more complex than that. So it's not just the mechanical stress. It's um, a combination of things. So we know that when people struggle with obesity, then they have a, a displacement of muscle tissue that helps to protect the spine and uh, facilitate normal movements. It's displaced with fat and it um, results in unhelpful compensatory mechanisms and movements around the lumbar spine. The, um, the other more recently understood uh, issue with obesity is the, the whole body uh, systemic inflammation that's occurring. And so if we look at the um, proportion of patients who never experience or are not experiencing back problems, um, actually the vast majority of these people are either um, either underweight, normal or overweight. When you look at people who are experiencing back problems, the vast majority of them are obese. So it, there's clear population level data to support this, there's scientific uh, reasoning to support it. The, the quite reassuring uh, component to all of this though is that it doesn't require someone to reduce um, their weight into um, the, the normal weight category to experience a significant reduction in uh, the back pain or neck pain that they're experiencing. Fortunately because you experience this dramatic reduction in the whole body uh, systemic inflammation, people who lose 5 to 10 kilograms experience a dramatic improvement in their back pain symptoms. So it's not a huge, um, I'm not trying to ask people to lose 20, 30 kilos kind of thing. Um, now if we look at um, what, and, and just to recap on what obesity is, because it's not a, it's not a, um, a subjective measure, it really is looking at this uh, BMI, which is purely a, a mathematical relationship between someone's height and their weight. And so people who, um, if you're 155 centimetres, at 72 kilograms you fall into the obese category, and then as you go up to about 175 centimetres, around uh, 92 kilograms. It's a, it's a huge, huge challenge to treat patients who are struggling with this problem though, because um, say if we say, okay, look, they're really struggling with back pain, let's uh, look at performing surgery on these people, then the, um, the rate of surgical complications is extraordinarily higher. So the rate of infections is five times someone who's just in the overweight category. If you look at, um, however, if we don't treat these people, uh, um, with surgery, unfortunately, they, um, they really struggle to make any form of improvement, even with physiotherapy and pain specialty intervention and that kind of thing. So it's kind of a rock and a hard place type uh, situation when it comes to managing people with uh, back problems who fall into that uh, obese category if they're BMI. Um, but like I said to you, the, um, fortunately, we can experience a significant improvement in symptoms from minimal weight loss. It really um, is quite stark that the patients who I, I give them the numbers and say, you know, we could perform surgery, but the reality is there's a five times higher rate of uh, infection. And infection in and around the spine and spinal cord is a complete disaster. Um, and patients who then have come back to me and said, look, I, I've lost, you know, four or five kilos, not a huge amount, but actually I'm fine now, thanks very much. Um, the um, one of the interesting uh, uh, components of what can cause people's back pain that can be reversed is their activity levels. Now, we look at um, activity as it really is like the Goldilocks uh, book. There's too little or too much really isn't acceptable. I said to you before that people who are involved in heavy manual occupations, repetitive lifting, uh, vibrating machinery driving, um, these types of activities really are too much for the spine and they do provoke uh, back pain and they, um, they can be managed and what most physiotherapists will call it is pacing, which really is like everything, it's uh, um, like financially, it's living within your means, okay? If you have some arthritis in your back, we have to limit what you do so you don't uh, fall into that too great uh, activity level. Um, if we look at the, the flip side to that though, and that's 
probably what's affecting more of society as we all start you know, being locked down with COVID and uh, having to do more things um, from an office rather than uh, heavy manual type uh, activities. It's, we start looking at the group of people who have uh, insufficient physical activity. And insufficient physical activity that in this um, survey they looked at as 30 minutes per day. And the number of people with back problems unfortunately do fall into this insufficient physical activity uh, group. It's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of situation when you look at surveys like that. Perhaps it's that people aren't doing activities because their back hurts so much. Um, but we really know if we can shift people over to uh, being more engaged in regular physical activity, we can actually reduce their, um, the back pain uh, that they're experiencing. And I'll show you more. Um, when it comes to exercise, the, um, that survey I said to you was 30 minutes per day, which is a lot. Uh, it's, it's, uh, embarrassingly, that's far more than I, I'm able to, to fit into my day. Um, but um, when it comes to exercise, and I'll, I'll show you more about this, really what I'm looking for people to do and what there's science uh, to encourage people to do is one hour low intensity exercise per week. That's it, 20 minutes, three times per, uh, 20 minutes, three times per week. And the recommendation of exercise that I give to people and, and uh, is tolerated by most people who are struggling with back pain um, or struggling with their sciatica or break algae type pain is walking in water. And you'll find that it's a common recommendation. It's one of the first things most uh, GPs will usually recommend uh, patients who are struggling with this pain to do. Most local pools have got a section of the pool that's shallow enough that you can walk in. And um, with the buoyancy and warmth of the water, it usually even just being in the water helps to settle down the back pain. And then walking in water, you get quite a lot of resistance from the water against you, which helps to um, activate the core muscles and gives you a tolerable low intensity exercise. Um, and if engaged in uh, for 20 minutes, three times per week, suddenly you start falling into this category of people that are uh, engaged in a reasonable amount of activity. Um, the uh, recommendation of, about trying to reduce BMI, look, there's no magic bullet uh, for that one. I think we're, a lot of people are now at the stage they need to enlist as much help as possible. Um, our GPs fortunately are now becoming more uh, enabled and linked in with services in the community, um, like dietitians and exercise physiologists to help uh, improve and help people with uh, reducing their BMI. Smoking cessation, also um, there's, there are medications that can be quite helpful now. And um, it, it all doesn't have to be directly, you know, wait for my GP appointment in two weeks time. We can um, start to directly enlist the help of some of the local services, such as the, um, your local physiotherapist. You certainly don't need a, a referral to uh, engage their assistance. And um, a lot of physiotherapist uh, groups, particularly ones who are interested um, in uh, management of back pain, will run a Pilates, uh, a supervised Pilates class, which is also ha has great uh, scientific um, uh, evidence behind it that it improves both neck and back pain and a lot of other ailments that people commonly experience, be it hip, uh, knee or shoulder pain. It's important though, um, and it's a hard thing to um, help to, to shift a mindset in some people that um, say to me, I went to my physiotherapist and they didn't fix the problem. Um, but unfortunately, it's not a problem that, that can be properly outsourced to somebody else. It's not a, a case of having a massage or uh, a manipulation or having a TENS machine put onto somebody. It really is an engagement in uh, supervised and um, strategically planned regular exercise uh, program. Am I making it up? I promise you I'm not. Um, the, <laughs> the, there's, um, I really, I, I only like to talk about things that have absolute scientific uh, proof behind them. I really don't like to talk about things that are just my general opinion or thoughts. I, I think I owe you more than that. 
there's a, a very interesting study um, out of Norway. It's quite a few years old now, but what they did, and ignore all this, this is more just um, uh, for reference type thing. Um, well, they looked at all these people who had um, either back pain or no back pain, and they tried to work out between um, people's weight category and their exercise levels, what was the more important thing if trying to reduce someone's back pain. And so if you look at, say, um, I don't count myself, I don't do enough exercise, but someone who is either normal weight or overweight, and so it's that BMI up to 30, and they uh, engage in satisfactory exercise levels, and that's that one hour um, per week of low uh, intensity exercise, that person's risk is about one, okay, so you call that the benchmark. If you look at someone who is obese, so their BMI is more than 30 and they're inactive, well, their risk is about 1.5, okay, so significantly higher uh, than the baseline. Um, suddenly, if you're um, you drop down to, say if we say, okay, let's reduce your weight, but continue being inactive, so just diet. You reduce your risk down to about 1.3. What if we say, don't change your weight, but change your exercise levels? Suddenly your risk of back pain drops from 1.5 to 1.16. So it's actually much better just to become slightly more active than it is to become uh, not in the obese category. And so it, it results in about a 90% reduced risk of back pain by engaging in one hour of exercise um, per week. It's not a perfect solution, okay? There are certainly people who are in that um, uh, activity level and they still experience back pain and it didn't work for them. But when you look at a statistical risk, if um, I'm struggling with back pain, I personally know that if I increase my activity levels, my back pain also settles down as well. There really is a close relationship between uh, people's activity levels or, or how sedentary they are and the amount of back pain that they experience. It's pretty similar when you look at neck pain as well. It's the same uh, Norwegian study. It's not as profound though. It's uh, your only results in about a 15% reduction in uh, the risk of back pain by increasing activity levels. So that's the vast majority of things that I want as sort of take home measures, activities that you can engage in this afternoon and, and strategies that you can um, commence uh, in your life without further intervention really from anybody else. The, um, now when it comes to your GP, people often wonder, you know, what's my GP going to do? You know, I've had this back pain now for about a, a year or more than a year. Um, a GP has a really, really tough job because when you turn up uh, to see your GP and you say you've got a sore back, they're trying to work out, is my back pain coming from this person's back or is it coming from the 50 other potential causes that are not related to this person's back? Um, things like having diverticulitis, an aortic aneurysm, or it could, some people experience a flare in their back pain that's directly related to a flare in their depression. Um, this, it's a similar sort of story if you come to your GP with pain in your neck, it could be that your neck, for sure, but there's a, a quite a um, significant overlap with a rotator cuff pathology, so shoulder uh, wear and tear, bursitis in the shoulder and arthritis as well. So that it's quite a challenging thing for your GP in their 15 minute uh, routine consult to get through to work out what's going on. Your GP also then will look at what are called red flags. And so red flags are the concerning features that might mean it's something sinister or nasty um, that warrants urgent uh, imaging and, and um, immediate treatment. Some of these things are um, like concerns about cancers and uh, awful nerve compression that's to a dangerous level. After your GP's um, uh, done this incredibly difficult task, they then go on to an examination which normally looks to pick up either the cause of what's going on, um, so examining the shoulders and hips and knees as well, looking for things like carpal tunnel syndrome that can mimic uh, neck problems. And then they also go on to uh, work out what nerve problem is at play here to help narrow down uh, if there's a, a specific um, uh, problem. The um, first line management for most 
people presenting with back and neck problems is observation. And the reason it's observation is because the vast majority of uh, back pain, even if you have every imaging test under the sun, um, even if, if you have uh, 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 very complex uh, nerve conduction testing, looking at the electrical wiring of the body, people experience awful pain. But for the vast majority, 90%, there'll be no structural cause found. And that's not because they're not experiencing pain, but that's because a combination of we don't really have the uh, ability to identify what the cause is, um, but also because it's not a really dangerous structural problem. And so for most people who have strained, twisted or otherwise, the GP's first line management is really just to watch for the first six weeks, provide some simple painkillers and uh, reassure. Now, most GPs then will ask you um, to come back and see them in about four to six weeks or um, if the symptoms that are being experienced, provided they're not considered dangerous or sinister, um, if they're going on. The, um, it's at that point then um, we usually progress through to uh, investigations. And so investigations are usually uh, imaging, so it might be a CT scan or an MRI scan, a simple x-ray can be helpful, or it might be a blood test. And blood tests can help to look for things that cause back pain, like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, infections. Um, usually painkillers, again, we really try to, um, the whole uh, medical community really try to limit the amount of opiate analgesia, so the morphine derivative drugs that are used because they are highly addictive. And as you've all seen in the US on the news, the opiate epidemic that's occurring over there, they unfortunately don't fix the problem and result in a whole new uh, realm of other problems that are even more at times difficult to treat. Often then, if pain's ongoing, your GP might recommend uh, engaging in a physiotherapist if you haven't already engaged with one um, beforehand. And sometimes uh, cortisone injections as well can be quite helpful. And the, your GP usually arranges that at SKG or one of the local radiology uh, providers. Now the next step is after your GP has uh, been through their uh, usual workup and observation and, and first line uh, management strategies, which I I'm slightly removed from, but I can imagine that that would exclude, you know, it would be able to treat and exclude from further specialist referral the, the absolute vast majority of patients. Given I said to you, 90% of people with back and neck pain, their pain settles down their own accord. Um, and then with these simple measures, often most pain is treated again. So it really is a tiny percentage of patients who will go on to require then uh, specialist treatment. But some of the reasons that your GP might um, send you on for uh, an opinion by a specialist would be that if you have severe nerve symptoms, and so this is a common test that's performed, uh, which if anyone has uh, or has experienced sciatica before, this type of position would be completely intolerable as it stretches the sciatic nerve and the nerves in the lumbar spine, causes uh, intolerable pain down the leg. Um, sometimes weakness, if the nerves are crimped too much, people can begin to develop weakness and um, that can usually uh, result in a, a prompt referral to a specialist. But even then, patients with a little bit of weakness and some sciatica, often that actually settles on its own without uh, intervention. Unfortunately, one of the uh, effects of a gradual stenosis in the spine that usually starts to affect people in their, their late 50s and 60s is a reduced ability to walk or stand still as the nerves start to fatigue. And so that's called, it's, as I mentioned to you, called spinal stenosis. And that's one of these things that, you, that can quite often uh, require a referral to a specialist. Those are all the nerve type symptoms. And as I said to you, we really do split these things into two different uh, categories. Patients who have got this ongoing, which is also known as recalcitrant, as in you know, resistant to all treatments that have been enacted by the GP, cortisone injections and physiotherapy, smoking cessation, uh, engagement in regular um, uh, exercise and weight loss, 
These patients, um, and they really become a very small number of patients who experience back pain or neck pain, that's, um, these patients might also then require a referral to a specialist surgeon. And uh, some of the things that can cause this, are, or one of the things that can cause this is instability in the spine. And what I mean by instability is that when typically wear and tear type changes uh, take place, they um, usually go on to cause a stiffening of the discs. Um, just like your knee might get stiff when you start to get arthritis in it, it's, it's quite similar in the back. But um, that often occurs in the spine, but sometimes in the back it doesn't go on uh, to stiffen, it becomes unstable and wobbles around too much and starts to bother the nerves and, and also cause uh, quite profound back pain. And so this is a, a picture here with the bones and discs lined nicely up on each other. And then you can see here this bone, the disc is uh, worn out between that one and then the bones don't quite line up. And that's, that's spinal instability. So that can also require uh, a referral to see a spinal uh, surgeon. Now, if, you are, um, if your GP recommends a referral to a specialist, I thought it would be helpful to go through what to expect. Um, now, what to expect uh, if you're referred to see uh, myself or uh, these are two of my colleagues in, a, in one of our offices uh, looking at uh, gentlemen's images. Um, now before your specialist consultation, um, what I will typically do is review the referral from your GP. So it's really helpful if your GP includes as much information as possible, where you're experiencing pain and how long you've been experiencing it for, what types of things have been tried and any nerve type symptoms that have been um, uh, experienced or, or even if they've been treated. Um, and perhaps if you've had other surgery before is also quite important to include, along with some of the other things that um, you might be struggling to control, such as uh, say smoking or, or say you can't, you're engaged in a heavy manual occupation and you can't take time off work. These things are all really helpful. And so I'll review these um, and, and, and similarly that there are in my practice a so neurospine, uh, there are, uh, it's my, um, Michael Kern and Andrew Miles and uh, there's another surgeon, uh, Paul Taylor. So the four of us um, have very similar uh, practice habits. And so we'll review the uh, referral and, and based on the referral, and sometimes we speak to the GP directly, um, we decide what imaging would be helpful for us to further clarify the picture. And so we might require you to have an MRI. Sometimes we have um, some upright or um, uh, dynamic imaging. So flexion and extension of the neck are quite helpful to look at. They're based on what the symptoms and uh, expected pathology are. We then also send out our patients a questionnaire form, which nobody likes filling out forms, um, but it's a necessary evil because we, we know that in a consultation, a lot needs to be uh, gotten through. We really need to have the absolute facts in front of us as to what, what occurred when, um, what your occupation is, exactly what your medical history is, if it hasn't been completely included um, with your GP. There really are some important questions that we, we cannot afford to, uh, to leave out if we've got a limited consultation time. We have to get through a lot. Um, so expect to have a questionnaire form sent out. <coughs> The, um, when you come along for your appointment, um, like most consultations with the doctor, it starts with us taking uh, what's called a history from you, so asking about your symptoms and how long you've had them and, uh, as I explained, um, what types of treatments, etc., that you've had. Um, and it's helpful if um, you write a list of questions that you might have. So some patients have a, a, a shopping list of questions, which is fine. Okay, it's absolutely fine. It's much, much easier for us to um, answer questions uh, that you've got in person because it's much, much quicker than having to have uh, people come back to ask us what are usually pretty easy things to answer in person. Um, we'll then typically go on uh, to have a, a physical examination. And so that involves, yes, testing the, um, the, the back and so the movements of the back, the neurologic examination, um, but also uh, we'll screen for things that are usually overlapping with uh, pathology that might be coming from the neck or the back. So I'll routinely examine uh, patient's shoulders, 
uh, look at their peripheral nerves, so things like carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel uh, type uh, syndrome, and also examine people's hips and knees. Um, so it's really is, a, it, it's a, in, when we're looking at people's spines, we're looking at the whole body. We, we're not just focusing on uh, one small area. The, um, we then, after physical examination, we'll then proceed on to uh, review the imaging, both the imaging that your GP has requested and also the imaging that will have been requested uh, for you to have before your appointment. The aim then is to reach a diagnosis and probably for, I, I think, the vast majority of people after going through these different steps, we have a, a, a reasonably certain diagnosis or, or at least what we call a working diagnosis. Um, or at least we've narrowed it down to a few different problems that we're then trying to work out. So it might be uh, arthritis in the cervical spine causing neck pain, also with um, some wear and tear changes in the shoulder. And then part of the process would then be to work out what's the main thing that's affecting uh, this patient or keeping them up at night. Um, so once we have a diagnosis, we'll then typically go over what the options for treatment are. There's always options for treatment. The, fortunately, the vast majority of things aren't dangerous and aren't concerning and aren't sinister. They're miserable. They cause people pain and they keep them up at night and they cause them to have to take time off work. But um, fortunately, there's usually the ability to consider different options uh, for treatment. I'll usually then be able to provide a, a recommendation as well. So that's the overview of what to expect in a specialist appointment. And then... Um, I thought what might be helpful for this uh, presentation is to go over what are some of the common uh, treatments that um, I might recommend. Not in detail, and, um, but rather so that you have an understanding of what different uh, treatment modalities are available to someone who uh, has neck or back problems. So um, when it comes to things, so um, uh, what are typically called conservative management. Conservative management is a bit of a funny term, but most people when they say that, they refer to uh, management that doesn't involve uh, surgery, or at least open uh, surgery. And so these can be things like, uh, I might recommend that you uh, switch and take a certain uh, anti-inflammatory medication, that actually, hey, you have this problem, but it might settle itself down in time. We're only six weeks into you having experienced this. Um, I might recommend physiotherapy or activity modification perhaps um, reducing the amount of uh, golfing and gardening that you do might reduce the symptoms to a satisfactory level without uh, having to go down the route of invasive treatments. We then sort of go up a ladder. So the next step onwards would then be something like injections or rhizotomy. And so this is a, one of the um, tests that um, are occasionally uh, useful in helping to identify causes for pain and um, this is a this is identifying that's a facet joint at the back so one of the little joints there um, is arthritic and it's the sole focus and, and cause of this person's pain and so when it's something simple like that these can often be treated with either an injection uh, so like a cortisone type injection um, or what's called a rhizotomy which is like an injection, but the tip of the needle, rather than uh, injecting cortisone, it actually heats up. And we know uh, quite well the anatomy of the nerves that give feeling to different things in the spine. And so we can selectively place the needle right near a certain nerve and heat the tip of the needle up and burn that nerve and, and uh, stop it from working without damaging all the other important nerves and um, take the pain being generated away from that. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for everybody. And the reality is that it's not a, a, not a miracle cure. So, um, but it is helpful in, in a select number of patients. And this is what rhizotomy is. So this is a needle going into someone's back. And this is um, a little electrical cable uh, connecting off to a machine uh, to heat up the tip of that needle. So that's, these are sort of the, the next step up the ladder beyond the simple uh, first line measures. Sometimes as well, um, it might be that after the examination and investigations that things don't quite line up and we suspect that there might be some other problems going on. And then we start to, to involve another specialty. That might be a pain specialist. So sometimes 
all of the imaging, examination, everything, we can't work out what's causing this person's pain. They're still experiencing pain, but we can't uh, find a target of something to uh, interfere with to stop that pain from being experienced. And so then we involve a pain specialist. Sometimes the, um, a neurologist is helpful as well, and we'll involve them if, there, if there's the potential for multiple different nerves to be involved, or perhaps the symptoms being experienced in the spinal cord don't quite match um, the problems that uh, we can see on the imaging. And then sometimes, like I mentioned, there's an overlap of pathologies, and it's, it's quite common for patients who have been over to see uh, the hip surgeon, they said, look, actually, I think the main problem is coming from your back. Or if I've seen them, I think, actually, I think if we uh, looked at the rotator cuff tear you have, we'll get your symptoms to a satisfactory level without interfering with your spine. And then the very last line of treatment for most surgeons would be uh, surgery. We really do try to reduce um, the amount of surgery that we do because unfortunately all surgery carries with it risks. Spine surgery for the vast, uh, vast majority of cases is actually extremely safe um, but we still try to reduce it because it's also got a recovery time associated with it. Um, and so I thought I'd go over the main um, types of surgery that uh, you might commonly hear people talk about. So, um, and these are really broad kind of terms, just so you, you've got an understanding um, as to what we might do. Um, so, the most common spinal surgery performed is what's called decompressive surgery. And when you've got, so this is a picture of the, um, the nerves of the spine coming out here, and this person has a, uh, a disc herniation or a disc bulge, and that's, or a slip disc, whatever you'd like to call it, and that's pressing on the nerve. And so, we decompress that nerve by taking the pressure off it. And what that involves is a combination usually of removing some of the overgrown tissue to give that nerve a little bit of extra space, so to make the tunnel that it travels through wider, and also removing whatever problem it is that caused uh, the issue in the first place, like removing this piece of disc that popped out. So these things are, are usually called ectomies, you know, so a discectomy or a laminectomy or a foraminotomy, so just removing uh, something. That's most spine surgeons' favourite surgery also to perform because it really results in, uh, for most people who are experiencing nerve pain, who are suitable for this type of surgery, um, to experience a dramatic improvement in their symptoms pretty quickly. They usually have one night in hospital and by about two weeks, um, they're getting back to their, their uh, light type activities. Um, this is an example here of how the surgery is performed. This is one of the newer techniques um, which is uh, using a tubular system. So rather than making a, an awful massive incision in someone's back, it you need about a two-ish centimetre uh, incision to pass these uh, tubes down. And then the surgery is performed under a microscope without um, extensive damage to the muscles of the back. So that's decompression surgery. Sometimes, um, extensive decompression surgery is required. And so by extensive decompression surgery, I mean I can't just remove a couple of millimetres of something to broaden the tunnel and, and remove a bit of something that wasn't meant to be there in the first place. And so um, for some people, a large, well not a large, but a, a significant proportion of the stabilising structures of the spine might need to be removed to free the nerves that are causing the nerve pain. If that's the case, then we can't leave the spine flopping around because it will damage the, uh, the nerves that are there after the surgery is complete. And so that's when uh, we look at fusion surgery, and that's to take away the movement of a single level. And this is an example of how fusion surgery works. And so um, this is someone's spine from the side here, uh, and the disc has been removed and replaced with a metal spacer that bo the bone will then grow onto and through. And then there's some scaffolding, uh, so there's some screws and rods attached to the back to lock it in place and allow the bones to then go on to stabilise that uh, level. So that's, that's fusion surgery and largely why fusion surgery is uh, required. Occasionally it's used to treat um, not specifically nerve um, compression, but um, to treat that instability that I mentioned to you before. So some people don't really have 
uh, nerve pressure or pressure on the nerves, um, but rather just instability of the spine uh, or deformity that requires fusion. The recovery is a bit longer though, and that's why we prefer just to do decompression surgery. So it's typically after fusion surgery, it's two or three nights in hospital, um, and usually around two to four weeks until people are getting back to even light duties. Um, now, when it comes to newer kind of uh, modalities of treatment, um, another one is um, where possible uh, to involve what's called disc replacement surgery. And so sometimes it's possible to remove the offending compressive elements in the spine and free those nerves and not actually take away the movement of that single segment of the spine that's moving, but rather replace the disc. And that's um, what's going on here. So this person has had a fusion, so they've I've, uh, had to place a metal spacer and some screws to hold this damaged segment together. But the segment below wasn't significantly damaged, and so I could remove the disc and free the spinal cord and insert a disc replacement prosthesis, which then in extension and flexion has differing positions, so it's a, a mobile uh, implant. There are some mechanical considerations, like any mechanical joint, it can wear out in time, so there are certain points in time where this is not appropriate, um, but it generally uh, has a, a faster recovery, so usually again about one night in hospital and around two weeks until getting back to uh, light type duties. In coming towards the end of the talk, as promised, I told you I'd talk about things that I'm only interested in, uh, which is uh, <laughs> advancements in spine surgery. So um, there's a lot, uh, spinal surgery is a phenomenal uh, area to work in. That There's a huge amount of research and development that, that's coming along. And um, so when this is what spinal surgery used to be like. And so what this used to be was a large incision in the lower back, all the muscle, muscles and tissues are pushed off to the side so all the bones of the spine could be seen. And then whatever procedure was required, removing some overgrown tissue, etc., putting some screws and rods in was performed. And this, the amount of damage that's done to the muscles in this was necessary, but um, it results in a, a delayed recovery. And, and society is all about, you know, everything's instant. We want things, you know, today, tomorrow, um, or in an hour. So it, it, this, the um, importance of accelerating people's recovery is, is, uh, is huge. So um, one of the really exciting um, uh, elements of spinal surgery has been the introduction of minimally invasive uh, surgery that results in less damage to muscles. Um, and less damage to the surrounding structures. So we really only interfere with what we need to interfere with. And this is one of the pieces of equipment that's um, soon to be uh, introduced at St. Uh, John of God in Murdoch. And this is an intraoperative CT scanner called um, the Aero. And uh, this is some very uh, clever technology. And so what happens is a patient can have a CT scan in the operating theater and then this camera can uh, show me exactly what's inside, so their bones, so I get a, a three-dimensional, kind of like an augmented reality type um, view of their spine. And um, just like Google Maps can tell you which direction your car's pointing in, this system can tell me what direction my instruments are pointing in. And so this is a, a navigated uh, surgical instrument that's being used to predict exactly where hardware might be being placed into someone's spine or where other surgical equipment's being utilised. And so no longer really is this type of thing uh, required for the vast majority of people. We don't need to see everything. The computer can see everything and I can be guided with the computer. And so it results in rather than this type of thing where there's a large amount of muscle damage to rather this is a, a surgery of mine not long ago, um, utilising not quite the latest technology that's going to be here very shortly. Um, but um, so it's just really what's keyhole surgery to use uh, instrumentation through one centimetre incisions without disrupting everything. And so these patients then start to have uh, dramatic uh, accelerations in their um, recovery. And then, um, okay, what's on the horizon? Um, so there's a few things that are not quite here yet, but will be here in not too long. And so 
There's ever advancing technology in imaging modalities. The imaging that I do today is vastly different from the imaging that I was that I had access to two years ago, which is, even then was vastly different to the imaging that I had access to two years prior to that. And so there's this ever increasing uh, ability to image the inside of people, and then there are stronger and stronger. Um, and more useful imaging modalities. And now there's the incorporation of artificial intelligence as well to not only obtain the imaging, but then to analyze the imaging and then to start to put two and two together. So we know what these patients outcomes are going to be like if they have these imaging and these set of uh, factors around them. So the, unfortunately, as much as I hate to say it, large, large computers are much, much more intelligent than I am. Uh, and, and they're only going to become more intelligent Hopefully I get a little bit smarter, um, but um, they will, will slowly shape and become more involved, not in just um, predicting simple things, but really starting to predict more of uh, what a recommended uh, procedure might look like or how it might be performed or even predicting what the outcomes might be. And then this is some of the technology that's still really in its infancy. This is spinal, uh, robotic assisted spinal surgery. And so this is a robot arm um, that's lining up some of the uh, hardware based on an intraoperative CT scan. And this, this technology really is, it's, it's pretty clunky and pretty rudimentary at the moment, but it, it really is starting to develop. And there's so much interest and uh, need for this advanced technology that it, it won't be long. I'll be standing here in a year or two giving you a talk about, not that we've got now an intraoperative CT scanner that's the, uh, the, the best resolution one available, but now we have a spinal robot that's further uh, advancing the precision of these uh, surgeries that are performed. And with that, I'll bring it to an end. So thank you all very much for coming out today and I hope I've uh, given you some useful insights and some things that can be taken home. Um, but I'm happy, uh, I, I'm being rung as you can see me hanging up a phone call on my watch. Uh, so I, I can't hang around for too long, but I'm more than happy to answer uh, any burning questions in anybody's mind. Yes, please. Fire away. Um, the average cost of this technology. Yeah, extortionate. Um, <laughs> but the average cost to uh, return someone to an operating theatre to revise one misplaced piece of hardware is also extortionate. Um, and I think as you know, all of you, you've seen the graphs, I'm sure, you know, of healthcare expenditure, just, you know, it's exponential. But part of that is the aging population, the need for treatment, but part of that is also our intolerance for um, inaccuracy. So it used to be that, you know, back when I was you know, first training, 90% of hardware being in the right place was acceptable. Like, that's not acceptable if it's my back. No, it needs to be 100%. And so the intolerance and, and uh, need for things to be exact, um, I think is important. And, and as it needs to be justified though. So a, um, you know, a $10 million clunky robot that, do, that adds 0.01% increased accuracy, I don't think that's justifiable, um, but something that's reasonably cost, uh, cost effective and provides a, a reasonable improvement um, in patient care is certainly uh, justifiable, yeah. yeah. Can scoliosis be straightened? Yes, yeah. definitely, yeah. Yep, yep. There's, there are limitations. So scoliosis is curvature of the spine. Um, there's, there are limitations. Um, you know, the, the screws and rods that I can put into someone can straighten anything. Um, but there are limitations in what a person's uh, biology can take and be that um, changing the shape of the spine and movement of the nerves so uh, can be one limitation. Um, the um, uh, fragility of bones as people age as well is another limitation. So it, it, certainly anything's possible but there's a lot that uh, there are risks involved and uh, recovery times involved. Yep. Yep. So think anything is possible, but it is always, it's, it's always a risk and benefit analysis. And it's, um, yeah, often when it's a complex thing as well, the benefit of working in uh, my team with uh, the three other surgeons, we, we commonly discuss uh, cases of what we think the 
best way to treat someone with a complex problem is to, to give them the best improvement with It'd the minimal amount of risk. Sorry? It'd be worth researching. To For sure. Look at yeah, absolutely. The absolutely. Any other questions here? Yeah. My daughter's 20 and apparently her discs are so condensed. This physio said she's got the discs of an 65 year old person. The GP doesn't want to investigate further because there's nothing you can suppose that you do. But what can you do to do like preventative or yeah. what can you do? Yeah, it's hard. I, I, I don't like. I, I run the risk of giving you uh, inaccurate advice, so I, I certainly don't want to speculate on sort of specific things. But in general, I think for most people, if you you have every right to seek as many opinions uh, for what is the right thing for you. So if you hear, if you know, I encourage my patients if they don't like what I say or they don't, you know, we don't gel and don't have similar outlooks on on things that I would encourage my patients to see uh, someone else and have as many opinions and bits of advice as possible. Yeah. 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 Yep. And then I, I think for some people it, it might be that you, you know, seek specialist uh, opinion as well. And then sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes spe you know, it's multiple you know, specialists can be consulted as well, especially when it's a difficult problem. It sounds like a, a really difficult problem. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, if, sorry. You know, if you know that you're going to be looking at surgery, but your mm. GP says we want to hold off as long as possible, yep. but being an ageing female, the risk of osteoporosis mm. increases. Yeah. It's that? a very fine balance, isn't it? Um, and look, I think the vast, the very vast majority of GPs um, send very sensible referrals at very sensible times. Um, so it really is, it's a management. And th there are a lot of people who have moderate symptoms who cope their entire life without intervention. So it's a really fine line, I agree. You were going to ask a question? I was wondering, like, you started the process with the general physio and now we're up to cortisone needles. Yep. How many cortisone needles before you can say, I've really had enough, I want to see a specialist and get a specialist? Yeah, look, there's no finite number. For some people, they'll have a cortisone needle every year and that's the only treatment they'll ever require. Um, there are some people who have the cortisone uh, injection and it lasts three days. And, and so it, it, my usual advice is when it starts not to do you know, anything useful, and that's in my opinion three days is not useful, uh, then that's when you start looking up that ladder. Um, yeah. Is there any risk in using the steroid injection as a pain management? Uh, yes, like a cortisone injection is, yeah, what, what's commonly known as a steroid injection, yeah, exactly. It's, it's actually normally not cortisone that's injected, so steroid's the sort of umbrella term, but yeah, it's hugely useful. Yep. Yep. All right, any other burning questions? Otherwise, we might wrap it up and I'll say thank you very much. Well, thank you. When you're saying you're quite happy, you think it's a good idea to ask for other opinions, if you've already had it specialists speak to you but you didn't gel and they were very blunt as to what your options were, you're quite happy for someone to go and ask. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a difficult thing and, and there are lots of problems and, and uh, it's nothing's ever clear cut, especially when it comes down to spinal surgery. Different surgeons have different training backgrounds and different sub, even sub 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 specialty expertise. So in my practice there are four of us and you'd think we'd all be you know, spinal surgery specialists, which we are, but there are certain things that that each of us do, you know, uniquely, and we think, you know, differently about. So, yeah, I, I'm more than comfortable with people having many different opinions and, and going with somebody who who they. You have to feel comfortable, I think, with the person who's treating you. Yeah. Good one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much.